clinic. Just a little bit about me, I trained in the UK, uh, I also did a fellowship in Canada, uh, and also uh, went off for various fellowships in China and in Colombia. Uh, all really ha and honing down my skills as a hip and knee surgeon. I'm offering a range of uh, um, surgeries, including from the sports injuries, uh, all the way through to joint replacements when people are a, a little, usually a little bit older and they've worn their joints out. I, I specialize in an area of joint replacement called rapid discharge recovery, uh, which is basically patients who are uh, 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 having a joint replacement can get out of hospital within maybe uh, 24 or 48 hours. Anyway, coming to the, uh, to the knee joint, let me uh, explain various structures to you. Uh, and see if they are related to the, uh, uh, the injuries we are having. So this is a knee joint, this is a femur, this is a tibia, this is what we call the extensor mechanism. It's made up of the patella tendon and the extensor tendon here. All these injuries can occur uh, usually through trauma. Okay, so I'm going to open up the knee, knee joint itself and then through the kneecap we call this the patella and we have areas of cartilage. This is stuff you will find familiar if you're, for example, eating a lamb bone, it's the white shiny stuff at the end of the bone. Okay. Now in a young person, more often than not, this is absolutely pristine. But as we get a little bit older, this wears out. And as we are overusing it, it can also wear out. And it can also be injured in trauma itself. It's very difficult to know exactly how much is worn out on a plain x-ray. And more often than not, we see these things uh, see a worn out cartilage from, uh, from MRI scans. Uh, we can assume the cartilage worn out and, uh, when a patient is over a certain age. And usually when patients get into a middle age, they start getting various degrees of it wearing out. And I would say by the time you're about 50, you're getting a reasonable amount of, you may get a reasonable amount of wear, depending on what you're doing on it, depending on your weight and all your circumstances. But certainly when you're in about the 60s or 70s, um, you will definitely have uh, uh, pretty may have a, uh, a worn out joint. It is the reason why in the UK there's uh, in excess of 80,000 knee replacements done uh, a year for individuals. It happens to be the case that in this part of the world the populations are quite, uh, quite a lot younger. So we don't see quite this level of arthritis in uh, this part of the world as we do uh, in, uh, in Europe and in North America. Okay. So that's why we have to focus on some other, uh, some other injuries that are quite prevalent around here. And certainly with a younger population, they're usually more active. Okay? And with that comes the injuries of being active. And I would say one of the most common injuries of being active is a meniscal tear. This is the meniscus, and I can show you in there. Now, normally the meniscus is made up of two C-shapes. You can see a normal C-shape and a kind of backward C-shape. They're called the medial and lateral meniscus. Okay. Now normally, as you can see in here, it's, it is stable. Okay. When I put my finger through it, nothing comes up, off. But in this model, you can see that there's a tear here. Okay. The rim is not stable. And this is what causes the pain and aggravation of a knee when you take it through a cycle of movements. Now the knee joint is very good in just compressing. So if you, for example, you jumped off uh, maybe a wall, a small uh, three or four foot wall, it would do very well if it went and landed like this. What it doesn't do so well on is when the knee twists. And if you can imagine a footballer taking a, uh, taking a kick, he will twist his knee whilst it's planted on the ground. And that will shear this meniscus. Okay, and that's a very typical sort of textbook definition of how a meniscus tears. Now, more often than not, this is a right knee. The reason I know that's the fibula is here and the tibia is here. Okay? More often than not, if you were going to um, decide which one was going to be injured, it would always be the inside and at the back. That's why on this model, they conveniently put it inside and the back of the knee. So more often than not, on a right knee, it would be inside here and you would get pain here. Okay? Now, how do we diagnose that? There's a couple of ways. First of all, you take a history. You ask them what they've been doing. More often than not, you've got a young man. He's probably in his 20s. He's twisted. He's... Uh, uh, he's twisted his knee and then he sort of felt a sudden pain afterwards and it hasn't gone away. He's usually come in maybe about two or three days later and it just hasn't felt right. It's aggravated, it's, catch, it's, it's catching, it may be locking a little bit or what we call pseudo lock. He's got to kind of straighten it out. It just hasn't felt right and it certainly isn't like his normal uh, left side of the knee. 
Okay, we then, I then uh, take the history, usually more often than not these young men are fit and healthy, maybe a little bit overweight, but they're not usually taking any tablets or anything like that. I then get them on the couch, I get them to straighten the knee and bend the knee, and there's a very specific area within the knee itself called the joint line, which is a very narrow area. And what I'm trying to do when I press the joint line is trying to stimulate the area of meniscus that has been damaged. And as we said, in this case, in the inside and the back of the knee. This is a very common diagnosis and it's a, a major cause of uh, why um, patients end up in surgery. And why do they end up in surgery? It's because this area does not have a natural blood supply. The blood supply into the knee comes in from, out, out, from inside and out. And by the time it gets to this middle part of the meniscus here, there's very little blood supply. And things with very little blood supply do not heal. So unfortunately, what you have to do is either remove this piece of meniscus, or in more modern terms, we would actually try and repair it. We would try and stitch it back. Okay, and there are various tools and tricks that we use now to do that. In the past, if you were having an operation like this in the 70s, it would be an open operation with a scar this big, and you do occasionally still patients uh, who've had one, and, um, and, and they would open it up and they would just remove the whole thing. And we know that is pretty barbaric now. We cannot do that. Okay, we need to preserve as much meniscus as we can so that the knee if he's in his 20s, it will survive and it will not end up being worn out. Okay? Um, so now what we do is a telescope within the knee on both sides of the knee. Okay, small incision, probably no bigger than being able to fit a pen inside on both sides of the knee. And the patients recover very quickly from this. And within about six weeks, there's a meniscal repair. That's slightly different and the rehab may be a bit longer because we need this to take. We need the repair to heal. Okay, so there may be a certain amount of restriction, particularly in the first six weeks. They may only go partial weight bearing, um, and uh, we may be in a brace, and you may have a very specific uh, area of your knee, so you may not wear out as quick. Okay, so we've discussed the cartilage, and we've discussed the meniscus. Okay, the other injury that is quite a little bit more severe to this is the anterior cruciate ligament. Okay, again, this type of injury is quite common in footballers. And you'll probably, if you're a very keen football fan, know various uh, um, uh, very famous players who've had this injury. I can spring to mind of Paul Gascoigne for England, that was in, back in the 90s, but certainly people like Ruvan Nistelrooy and uh, Alexander Oxlade Chamberlain. These are all guys that have actually recently undergone this, uh, this injury. Now this injury is quite a lot more severe, so much that the, although the, the operation to, um, to fix it is relatively straightforward. We can either take a, a hamstring graft or we can take a, a piece of uh, tendon from here, from the patella here, and, we, and with two little bit of bone plugs. The rehabilitation is the, uh, is the thing that really sets this injury apart from, from the meniscus because this can take from nine months to, to a year. So if people have an ACL injury, it's pretty much a season out, okay, uh, until they're rehabilitating again. And again, it's a very specific set timeline once you do this operation uh, to actually, uh, um, uh, uh, to, to, for the protocol to follow through. Um, so we've discussed the cartilage, we've discussed the meniscus, uh, the ACL. Occasionally you can have what's called the posterior cruciate uh, ligament uh, injured. Uh, again, this is relatively rare. This is usually from a hyperextension injury. Someone's skiing and they've kind of landed on something bad and they've kind of got into that position. This is relatively un uncommon, and I would say the, uh, the, the numbers to fix that are, are much, much less. And the indications to actually fix it are um, uh, much less as well. I would recommend anyone in their, most people who are active in their 20s, 30s, maybe even their 40s, to have an ACL reconstruction if they want to maintain their activity. The knee is quite a complex joint in so much that it doesn't just hinge, but it, it rolls back and it, there's also a certain amount of what we call screw home. It, and as a result of not having an ACL, you end up with a worn out, much more worn out knee, uh, or theoretically you could end up with a much more worn out knee at a later date. The other problems you can have with a knee are a, uh, a medial collateral ligament. So if you've been into a tackle, for example, and you've, uh, and you've stressed this ligament, this can be injured. And this is also very, very common and incredibly painful. If, for example, you've been skiing, maybe in the Dubai ski uh, thing in the Mall of the Emirates, you will find that if you, 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 your skis will uh, rotate away and your leg is planted on the ground, you will injure this ligament. And it's quite common ski injury. 
Okay. Now, if it's only injured partially, which most of the time it is, it just needs a bit of rest, maybe a brace, uh, a hinge brace, and, the, and it will heal. It has a remarkable power of healing, partly because it's vascular. It has a blood supply, mm -hmm. unlike the one we were talking about, the cruciate ligament here. Okay. Same thing can happen on this side, on the lateral side, on the lateral collateral injury. Okay. Again, this is probably a little bit rarer, but when we need to fix this, uh, for stability, then it's a much bigger operation. Mm. Okay, um, so these are sort of general uh, injuries that we can have uh, for, for, from the knee. And then, of course, we have arthritis later on. Okay, uh, let's start. Uh, thank you, doctor. Uh, so, doctor, from all the explanation that mm. you have provided for us, uh, one of the questions came to us is that how do you know that you have damaged your knee exactly? Well, first of all, from a medical point of view, we would ask the question, what have you been doing on it? Okay, mm -hmm. now have you been playing football? Have you been you know, doing some sort of volleyball or something like that? And can you remember specifically what, uh, what caused this injury? Okay, were you, for example, a basketball player, he might have forgotten about it, or was there something specific like he landed badly? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, a good question to ask a patient is, were you playing afterwards, immediately after that? And if the patient immediately says, no, no, I had to come off, then that gives you a sign that the severity of the injury is much greater. Uh, okay. So if he was still playing and he really didn't feel it, okay, then my threshold for that injury might be slightly less. But if he had to come off the pitch, that's usually quite a good, uh, a good question. Okay. So probably because they were playing or they were injured, but if he didn't play or anything happened, so what's the regular course can be for that? Well... <laughs> Um, if that's, for example, if he wakes up two or three days later after, say, squatting or something like that, that, that sort of generalized knee pain, there hasn't been any direct trauma. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we've got to kind of elicit between, the, uh, has there been any direct trauma, has there been any kind of specific twisting or something that has caused this knee, or is it perhaps from slightly overuse? Okay, and the overuse type of injuries are quite common in lockdown at the moment because everyone's at home, everyone's probably doing a bit of work at home, they're probably doing a little bit more uh, uh, squats and these sorts of things, and they're injuring the knee. Now, why is a squat, as great as they are, quite damaging to the knee sometime, okay? You're putting a lot of pressure on the knee in a mid-flexion stance, okay? So you imagine the knee goes down and you, the contact pressures between the kneecap and the knee bone it's, and the femur are quite high. So I see a lot of patients, for example, who don't say, I, I did some squats, but that was usually about two or three days ago. And it wasn't hurting in the first 48 hours, but by the third day, I could hardly get out of bed. And that's usually, that's a very common uh, uh, description of, of a squat. So really the inflammation, the pain has been set up within uh, this area here. Mm. I tell them that, you know, if you're going to do any sport, you just have to go slow, okay, to start slowly. If you suddenly just start to get active again after a period of inactivity, do not just go for it. Uh, uh, you know, on day one and just do like three hours in the gym and, you know, 100 squats. Go slowly, okay? And the other thing, particularly as we get a little bit older, these areas, as I said, the cartilage will be a little bit more worn out, okay? okay. So the chances are that we're going to get more of these types of injuries, okay? And we're going to get more of these kind of non-specific knee pains. And in that, in, in what I tell patients is we should actually uh, vary our exercise regimes a little bit. You know, maybe one day in the pool, maybe walking, then we'll do a hit class, you know, maybe we'll do something on the bike. And I emphasize to the patients there's a big difference between an impacting sport and a non-impacting sport, okay? So an impacting sport, like, for example, uh, running, okay, versus, mm. you know, you may be going just, uh, you know, on a, a rowing machine, okay? Now, the, you can correct, someone will correct me if I'm, uh, or not, but I usually tell my patients that when you run, Okay, it's seven times your body weight going through one run step, run, run, run phase. Oh, like okay, that's seven weight, times yeah. the amount of force and pressure on your knees. Okay, so you better have good quadriceps strength, and you better be nicely conditioned to do that. Because most people can do it. Most people, I, I see a few people who say, you know, I went for a run, and uh, and it was just painful. Maybe 24, 48 hours later, it wasn't straight away. Okay, again, like the squatting. I said, well, how much running were you doing before? And they said, well, no, no, this is the first time I've been running for about three or four months. Okay, so, well, there lies the problem. You haven't conditioned yourself gradually to do this. Okay, oh, oh, and then they don't run for another, you know, six, seven, eight weeks because of the pain that they've caused. So it all has to be done in a slow and gradual way. 
uh, like not run like immediately for a long distance. Exactly, yeah. and that's the big mistake. People suddenly wake up one day, maybe it's January the 1st, and set a new resolution to be fit, you know, and they go out and they just, you know, burst themselves into oblivion. So the idea that you just gradually put yourself through, and I think lockdown has certainly had that impact as well. Mm. People are suddenly more at home, they perhaps want to be a little bit more act active, and they've ended up just, you know, injuring themselves. And you've got to be good to fight another day. Okay, so I always yeah. say take a little bit back and, and so you can go again tomorrow. Because it's better to have two good days than one, one good day and then you're, you know, you're, you're done gonna... for, the, you know, for the week. You know? All right, uh, doctor, uh, so if you are running, yes. so this cartilage area is going to be like damaged? Well, that's a good question. And, that, and that, the jury is very much out on that. Okay? Now, no doubt about it, if you're, if you're overweight, you've had previous damage to the knee, you might incur a little bit more damage. Okay, mm. I'm a great advocate of people staying active. Okay, of in various course. forms. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can run and you're, you know, young, fit, and active, do it. You know, as I said, just do it gradually. But if you're overweight and, and, and massively overweight, even, yeah. and you have a slightly damaged knee, maybe you have a bit of uh, uh, cartilage damage, you're going to probably increase that damage even further. Okay. Mm. Now, it has come to light within the last year or so that. People who are marathon runners, they've done, they've, re they've done an MRI afterwards and they've actually found that the cartilage is stronger okay, from that. Oh, okay? Okay. And that's relatively new because mm. there was always an assumption if you overdid it in your knee, if you did a marathon, which is not a natural distance for any human being to be doing, yeah. okay, it will cause more pain and damage. Now, it's quite a revelation that people have now done an MRI and they've actually thought that maybe the cartilage will be protected. Most things in, in nature like to be like stimulation for them to stay strong and healthy. You know, if you want strong muscles, you have to go to the gym and stimulate those muscles. Of course. If you want strong bones, if you want to prevent osteoporosis, a disease where we all get as we get older, we have to stimulate the bones. You know, uh, with staying active, either walking or running or, or uh, just giving them the, the cyclical load that they need. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you cannot, you know, use it or lose it. We say. Okay, yeah. you have to keep using it. So I'm a great advocate for people staying active and getting out there, but they have to not overdo it. Of course. And was, is there any sign that your, your knee will be swollen or something that yeah. you will take it and it hurts a little bit and you cannot uh, make it straight? That's well, exactly that, it. that would be... Which that would be it, yeah. I mean, so, so people, pain is very subjective and it's very variable in, in, in people. And I've seen people with very worn out knees with relatively little pain, and people with minimum amounts of uh, uh, damage to, to their knees, and they get a, a lot of pain. And we can't really gauge it in, in that way. However, pain is usually a very sensitive indicator um, of, uh, of, uh, of something going on, either inflammation or damage with the knee. Uh, inflammation, the knee. yeah. Okay? And so I always tell patients, you just cannot run through and take tablets and think you're going to run a little bit further. Okay, mm -hmm. this is very damaging and very harmful. And you occasionally meet patients who are doing that. Okay, oh. they've said, "Well, I take a, a little anti-inflammatory, take a painkiller, and that just gets me the extra mile or extra two miles." Your body is telling you something at that point, and you have to stop. Okay? Stop immediately. Okay, and you certainly can't get through it with injections and stuff like that. That becomes more of a problem with professional sportsmen. You may be playing for a top Premier League uh, club, and he want, and the manager wants you on that pitch on Saturday, and it's Tuesday. Okay, he needs to get you out there. Now, he, you know, he knows that you've got three other people in your position. Okay, so of course he's going to do everything he can to get on that pitch on Saturday. Okay, he's going to take an injection, he's going to take a few pills, and then he's going to get out there. Okay, those are very damaging. It's very, very harmful. But unfortunately, and particularly in professional players, this is quite a common practice. But doctor, you said uh, uh, injection, you don't mean painkillers, right? Is there an injection that helps you like to build something in between that it won't harm the bones? Um, uh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there's a, there, is a, there are various injections we used. In the past, people were using a lot of steroid. That mm -hmm. damps down the inflammation, okay? Um, then uh, there's an injection uh, uh, which uh, we use, which is hyaluronic acid, okay, which is sort of replicating the synovial fluid, the fluid within the knee. It's a, it's a kind of gluey-like substance within All the right. knee, like the oil effectively mm -hmm. in the knee joint, okay? This uh, we used to uh, we use quite a lot, but the studies have suggested that they're uh, it's effective about 50% of the time, 
I actually have quite a lot of patients that I give this injection to, and I, I think uh, I tell them that. I say, it's not my first line, but if you're coming back to me again after six weeks, maybe physio and resting, and, you know, and you've got a slightly arthritic knee, then I might consider an injection within your knee, okay, in, right. the early, in early arthritis. Okay? In the early arthritis. In the early, it doesn't really work for the late stage where this is completely worn, okay, mm -hmm. where this meniscus is completely worn. The meniscus okay. is the problem yeah. most of the time for Yes, us. exactly. It doesn't, you, the shock absorber is not, uh, is not there. And maybe, and as I say, the cartilage is not there. So, doctor, can you explain a little bit more about how would you get an inflammation in the knee? Okay. If you have a healthy knee, you okay. might get an inflammation. Yeah, well, you can, you can, you can certainly get certain uh, conditions like rheumatoid arthritis and uh, inflammatory conditions that may come in systemically. And that, you know, you may have some kind of genetic predisposition from that. Mm. Um, you may have uh, an underlying predisposition to gout, and that's related to dietary things. These are relatively uncommon, and that they're not usually the what we deal with in uh, orthopedics. You know, of that course, usually yeah. goes to the rheumatologists. You know, the yeah. physicians for the joints, and they have various um, clever Ways. potions and mm -hmm. pills to treat that. You know, you'll tend to find that orthopedic surgeons are relatively simple souls in terms of the fact that they they uh, they do they deal with uh, mechanical type uh, problems. On that okay. problems. Yeah. All right. So uh, in terms of uh, inflammations, then of course you can inflame the knee from just overactivity. You know, if you've done one too many squats or whatever, you know, and that, at that point, you just tell patients you've got to back off, you've got to rest. And I tell patients, you know, usually you've got to rest it the knee for a good length of time, four to six weeks. Mm -hmm. But obviously, if you've got a top flight contract in Chelsea or something <laughs> like that, you're really try, struggling. You imagine not make, missing six weeks of a football season. So oh, patients, see. particularly the more active they are, the, the less they're willing to take that advice. Apparently, you're watching the English League, right? Yes, of course. Yeah, Chelsea. Yeah, yeah. Mm, occasionally, but no. Liverpool, <laughs> Liverpool actually, but, yeah. All right. Uh, uh, thank you, doctor. Uh, yeah. As a, sp uh, a consultant in the field of the hip and knee, yeah. I wanted to ask you that the ages that they might get the knee uh, problems, the is age. there specific? Yeah, that's a good, very good question. So, I mean, certainly in this younger population in Dubai that I have, I have an expats, and if they're running into problems within their, particularly in their hip, they may have a condition called avascular necrosis. Okay, so that is a condition where the blood supply is starved uh, within the hip joint itself. I don't have a hip joint today, but for some reason, it's been starved. Now, half, 50% of the time, we don't know the cause, okay? But there are some causes, and then there's 200 causes, okay? So you, take, you, you ask the questions uh, about it to the patient. Have you taken any steroids? You know, what's your alcohol consumption? Uh, well, you know, are there any underlying blood disorders? Mm. Have you had any trauma? You know, have you had been in a road accident in your past or anything like that that's damaged the hip? Okay, so these are the sort of fairly common questions that can basically have the, the head of the, uh, jo uh, the hip joint die effectively. Okay, mm -hmm. and you're walking around on a on a sort of dead hip dead hip joint effectively, and then you might need to. If the pain is severe enough, and if the, the stages are severe enough, you may end up with a hip replacement. And I can do hip replacements even in patients in their teens with that. But my first case in Dubai was a 14-year-old who had a road traffic accident, okay, and oh. had a completely worn out hip, okay? This is not common, and it's not something we would choose to do, but we had to really give him something back because he was just not walking. He was in a lot of pain, uh, his spine was getting twisted because his leg had become short, uh, and so this was really the only option he had left. It was a completely dead hip. But then certainly my stock patient in Dubai can be you know, in their 40s or 50s, which is relatively earlier than most of my patients back in Europe, which would have been in their 60s or 70s. 60s, the old ages. Yeah. So certainly as you get older, you're gonna get these problems. And that would have been, that was most likely from arthritis. Now arthritis is an interesting one. There's no doubt you can get that at any age, but certainly as we, as we live long enough, and certainly as we grow older and we're get, getting to the point where <clears throat> everyone is living to a good ripe age, but they will get arthritis, okay? And mm. certainly within about, I would be very surprised if you haven't had anything uh, any problems within your joints uh, uh, after, before, yeah, pre, uh, after 60 years old. But certainly within your 70s, you're going to have some degree, varying degrees. Of yeah, but you might because of the osteoporosis and because your body immunity, vitamins you require. Yeah, it's not really related to that. I mean, uh, the osteoporosis and, um, it's not, it doesn't seem to affect the amount of arthritis you get. Oh, it doesn't? No, no, it, it, we don't really know uh, why that's the case. We don't really know 
um, who gets more arthritis than others. But we certainly know that if you've had any, if you're a little, if you're overweight, you're obviously putting a lot more pressure on your joints. If you've been, certain professions are quite interesting in terms of the arthritis. For example, builders. You know, over a typical uh, builder in, in the UK maybe may be overweight and he may be down on his haunches all the time, effectively doing like a squat, like a permanent mm -hmm. squat, putting a lot of pressure within his joints, within his knee or hip joint. Um, if he's doing a, a lot of kind of repetitive things, if he's had a previous injury, this may, may, uh, may, occur, with may occur with the situation. Yes. So one of the last questions, doctor, is that knee replacement. Yeah. How, how, what is it? Is this new, I think, technique? Well, uh, yeah, it's definitely not a new concept. I mean, hip and knee replacement, both of them have around, been around about 40, a long time, 50, 40 50 yeah. years now. So the hip, first hip replacement was put in 1962 by Sir John Charney, who's from Britain, the UK. Uh, it's not all from America. And, uh, and the second, and the, and, and the uh, first knee replacement was around about 1970. So about the time I've been on this planet. So about nearly 50 years now. Okay. Oh, yeah. Now, Various designs and various concepts, uh, and I won't bore you with all that, okay, uh, it is very interesting if you're in that field, but essentially the operation has changed dramatically, and it's even changed dramatically within even in the last 10 to 15 years, okay? So what we found was that all the implants that we put in were all pretty much doing the same job at that, uh, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we could see right. that survival figures were, were pretty much the same. What has changed is the things around that, the pain relief, uh, the way patients mobilize, with the way we minimize the swelling. Um, these are all very important. And the way that every member of the team has a set way of going through uh, the, the procedure. So for example, the physio will know exactly what to do with the patient on day zero, which is the day we operate, we call that day zero. Day one, we'll know uh, how much the patient will get up, but, you know, whether they're gonna go to the stairs or not, by day, day two. Now, even to the point now where people are advocating same day discharge for a hip or knee replacement. And this is a, it's a relatively new concept, but uh, certainly for a young, fit and healthy patient, of course. Uh, you can have patients out within the, the same day, but certainly within uh, 24 to 48 hours. You don't need to use any blood transfusion or very minimal amounts of blood transfusion these days. You don't need so many pipes and all this. And in the past, this could have been like 10 days to two weeks in hospital. We're talking about in the 80s or and, yeah, and the of 90s. Course. But nowadays, you know, we've streamlined the whole process around mm -hmm. a hip and knee replacement. And that's something that I do specialize in and something I do uh, know a, uh, a fair bit about. And we're, you know, Transplant or uh, implant and then you can go out home. So it's, yeah. really, it's really amazing. That's definitely the future. I mean, that's mm -hmm. definitely the, uh, what's gonna happen. Obviously there's robotics as well uh, that have come in. Uh, again, the jury's still out whether these things, any change that comes into a medicine has to be a change that really has an outcome for patients down the line. Okay, yeah. and a lot of these things, particularly in the joint replacement world, don't re we don't really know until they've been 20, 30 years tested. Okay, yeah. if I put a knee replacement in you tomorrow and say I use a robot, I don't know whether that robot has really given me any more advantage. Some people claim that the, the pain relief is less and that they rehabilitate a bit quicker, but they may have been wanting that to happen anyway. So unless there's an objective True. randomized trial on that stuff, then really, we're, you know, the jury's still out. And particularly if you're an elderly patient, you, you just want a good knee replacement. It doesn't really matter whether the robot has done it or not, okay? <laughs> you know, it, it, because, you know, uh, it may matter, be more critical if I'm doing a knee replacement in a younger patient when I have to get the alignment absolutely perfect so this thing lasts for, you know, maybe 20, uh, 25 years plus, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's a, but for, uh, for patients, uh, particularly elderly, it looks like the elderly patients, this is, doesn't matter. You just want one done in your lifetime that will give you a good and active life uh, for the rest of your life. All right, thank you, doctor. We finished all the questions. Thanks for all the answers. I really have new information about knee. Pleasure. So I'll take care of my knee right now. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you. Thanks for Dr. Paul, our thank consultant uh, orthopedic surgeon specialized in hip and knee. I appreciate it for the session. Thank you. Thank you.